Welcome to Zen Madman's super simple solver proto primer for GTO base. My goal with this video is to give you a basic idea of how to use this very powerful application. My goal with this channel is to create the most educational and entertaining poker YouTube channel out there. If this primer feels like it's still a bit over your head, please go ahead and subscribe anyway, as I'll be adding more and more videos from absolute beginner to very advanced. And don't be afraid to ask questions in the comments. However simple or complex they may be, I'll always try to answer to the best of my ability. And I'll be doing a more in-depth guide to solvers at some point in the future. For now, I just wanted to get this out there so anybody who's watching my Twitch series, which is gonna be from 10 a.m. until noon Pacific time, every day in June, so two hours of solver study each day, I'm gonna be taking one spot and really digging into it. So what is a poker solver? There's lots of different solvers available. Today, we're gonna to be talking about GTO base, which isn't exactly a solver itself, but we'll get to that. They don't all work the same, but my understanding is that in general, a poker solver is a computer program that plays poker against itself over and over again, iteratively improving its strategy until it approaches unexploitability. So what does that mean? Basically, it's a program that develops an unbeatable strategy given certain caveats, right? We're going to use a simplified model to run the solve. And so what happens is when people deviate from that simplified model, the program doesn't really tell us exactly what to do. Furthermore, we're not really supposed to look at the solved data and be like, oh, this is how I should always play. No, what it does is it teaches us how to think about the game. It teaches us about the underlying structure, about who has what hands in which situations and what should they do with them. And then as we discover or make assumptions about how other people play and how that might deviate from this optimal strategy, we then usually would like to deviate in a counter exploitative way. They're making a mistake, so then we're going to deviate from the optimal strategy in order to exploit that mistake. But then that opens us up to being exploited. So basically, the point is, is the solver says, hey, here's a very balanced way to play where someone can't beat you if you play this perfectly and they remain within the guidelines. Mostly, it teaches us how to think about the game better. Let's take a look at GTO Base. Here we are at gtobase.com. I am going to hide my picture and we're just gonna look at full screen. All right, so what we've got here is we're gonna mostly delve into the six max cash, which is currently free, which is amazing. It's pretty absurd that you can just use this for free. You can also use heads up cash and you can use multi-table tournaments for these various different starting stacks as you, you see here on the left. For heads up with an ante, you have to pay and for spin and go, you have to pay. I think because those have been fully completed. I'm not certain. But uh, we'll take a look at, at the six max cache. That's what we're really going to dig into. So we're going to go up here to library. And I'm going to now explain a little bit how this works, right? GTO base isn't a solver that does solves for you when you're like, hey, what about this hand? It's a library of pre-solved solutions that you can basically navigate through. And you can also play with this trainer up here where it'll basically put you in a situation and you decide what you would do in that spot. And it, it tells you whether that's optimal or whether that deviates by a particular you know, amount of value. So we're gonna go here to six max cash. We'll click on that. It says free to use, right? We're gonna go down to view. We're just gonna keep it simple to begin with. We hit view and basically you see the table in the upper right. I'm not going to have that visible all the time when I'm doing my streams but it's a kind of convenient visualization, right? You see the table, there's a small blind, there's the, the big blind, and then everybody's got 100 blinds, right? Under the gun, which I call the low jack, on the lower left-hand corner, you see that it's their turn, right? It's the low jack's turn. And this is how the low jack is supposed to play all the hands in their range, which to start the hand is all the hands, right? There's, um, there's 1,326 combinations of hands, and they fit in this... 13 by 13, 169 box matrix. And basically you can either raise all these hands in blue, you can fold all the hands in red. And when a hand is part red and part blue, that means sometimes do one, sometimes do the other. And if your opponent is playing an unexploitable style just like you, like they're playing the same balanced style as you're playing, then you're gonna be fine doing either of those options. If they 
get a load of, say, you're folding all the hands that you can mix, then they can theoretically exploit that, but they probably won't. Here, a hand like King-10 Offsuit, you can hover over it and you see it says fold it 61.43% of the time, raised to $2.50 or 2.5 blinds really, 38.57% um, of the time. And you can approximate that or you can just say 50-50 or whatever you wanna do, right? And then a bunch of these hands you can see are mixes, right? And so you can just always fold those if you want and that's not that big a deal. You can always raise them and uh, some of them that if you always raised all of them, like deuces, you're supposed to raise a little less than 1% of the time. If you always did that, you're probably raising too much and then they can three bet you a lot. But uh, the gist of it is if you more or less follow this, that's going to give you the proper ranges to then proceed on future streets. So let's say that you did raise. We click this 2.5, right? Bet 2.5. Then it proceeds to the hijack. And it's like, okay, what is the hijack supposed to do with all their hands? Well, they're supposed to fold a lot of them. Right, and you can look at the box here and it says raise to eight, so eight blinds, right? So a little more than three times the raise size with 8.09% of range. So basically tens and better, uh, king 10 suited and better, ace jack suited and better. This is a kind of curious thing here. Uh, solvers sometimes do some really counterintuitive things, but then a mix of hands like ace 10 suited, ace queen off, uh, nines, ace five suited most of the time, ace four suited, right? And so there's a lot of hands you can see you wanna mix at some frequency. And when we're mixing, we can, you know, as I said, you can either always do one, always do the other, find some randomization tool, or kind of go by your mood. That's probably not the best, but the, uh, the one that I think is probably the most effective is to say, okay, I have ace four suited and I can either three bet them or I can fold. How does this player play? Is this a person I want to be three betting a little extra? Then I'll just always do ace four suited. Is it somebody that is really tough and I, you know, I, I maybe I just want to get out of their way a little bit and play more pots against the other players at the table, right? Play more hands against the other players. Then maybe you don't want to tangle with them and you fold that hand that's a mix. Whereas a hand like ace queen suited, you're not folding that just because your opponent's tough, right? That's, that's just a hand you got to play because it's too strong. Unless you have some read that like they only read raise aces and kings and then whatever, I guess you can fold. So let's say the hijack folds and you'll notice that there was no option to call given to the hijack, right? And the cutoff here also only can fold or three bet. Now we know that in poker they can call and some solves will allow them the option to call. Now the hijack and cutoff aren't generally supposed to call that much when the low jack open raises, they're mostly supposed to three bet. The gist of it is um, because these players are never cold calling, that might influence some of the hands that the low jack, that the under the gun player was raising because they knew they were less likely to get called, right? Because we didn't give the solver this option. Uh, similarly, if like we didn't give them a three bet option or the three bet size was like to 20 blinds, that would also probably alter what ranges got played. So let's say that the cutoff folds. Now we'll see that the button, now that it gets to the button, now there's three colors, right? They've introduced yellow here because we've allowed the button to call here, right? The button can make some calls, some cold calls. And that's because nobody's gonna three bet behind them. If there's a three bet, it's gonna come out of the blinds. The button's gonna get to see what the other player did, the original razor did. And then if they wanna call, they're gonna have position, absolute position for the rest of the hand. That's very important. So we're allowing the button to call. And as you can see, you know, they're calling about six and a half percent of their hands. They're three betting about 7.3% of their hands, and they're actually still folding 86% of their hands, right? When the low jack open raises, you're, you're just not able to play that many hands against them if they're playing a proper range and they're gonna play optimally post-flop. If they're gonna make a ton of mistakes post-flop or they're raising way too many hands, then you can indulge in some sort of exploitative strategy, right? You don't necessarily wanna limit yourself to this sort of unexploitable strategy. This is a framework for if this person's playing really well and really balanced, then this is the gist of what you wanna go with. And you'll see that pocket pairs like twos, threes, fours, you really only wanna call them a little bit against this raise size, assuming that everybody's playing well. Whereas if you don't think people are playing well, you can probably call them more. If I had looked at this before my session today, maybe I would have folded pocket deuces instead of losing a big pot after flopping them, but uh, set. But who knows? You know, on the other hand, maybe it was a good spot to call with them because the big blind was a loose passive player, right? So when you're actually playing, you wanna take those things into account, 
but you want to learn the idea behind this is is you get to learn kind of the structural way that's a, a very kind of defensive um kind of impenetrable style right it's like a i think of it kind of like a fortress or like when i used to do taekwondo like my sidekick like i was just like look you're coming at me. I, I don't care. I have a sidekick. You, I'm just going to kick you away, right? You're just not going to close the distance. Whereas if I was standing a different way, thinking a different way about fighting that was more aggressive, then I would also be more vulnerable, right? I would have a better chance of attacking my opponent and and hitting them when they're being more defensive. But if I line up like a, a sidekick, then I've, I'm less exploitable, right? In theory, that's, that's kind of how it worked then anyway, partially just because I'm, I'm pretty tall, which helps. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, that's a, a little bit of a tangent, but I think you get the gist where here basically, you know, um, all these like ace eight suited plus we're not going to go into detail, but you know, these suited Broadway hands, you get to play all these hands and you get to play more of the pocket pairs. Right. And there's these ones that mix. It's like the, all three, some, some call, some fold, some raise. I like to call it the Neapolitan. Cause, uh, if you change the colors, it would look like, you know, the, the three flavor ice cream. <laughs> so anyway, let's say that the button does call, right. And then the small blind has the option to, raise which would be a squeeze against a raise and a call or they can fold we'll have them fold and then the big blind has call fold and raise now if we put in call yeah so there's no solutions here because if the low jack raises the button calls and the big blind calls we're now looking at a three-handed spot right and those are harder to solve because they're just much more complicated situations. There are ways of doing it, right? I've I've used a monk or solver to do that. Um, GTO base is from Simple Poker, and I think they have a product called Simple Three Way, which um, yeah, there are no simple three ways. But uh, the idea is that you can solve for three handed spots, right? But this doesn't have that as of yet. Maybe at some point it will. Oh yeah, there it says uh, possibly it will be added later, right? So you hit okay, and uh, we'll just make the big blind fold instead, right? And so that means if you have a particular hand and you want to look it up this way, that hand isn't going to work that way, right? Sometimes you can find kind of an approximation, but uh, this is going to be really good for training two handed pots, right? Heads up spots and also just understanding kind of how these situations work and then those lessons can often be applied to other scenarios right just kind of understanding how ranges interact so so far we've got the low jack against the button so now there's a flop right uh, let's throw in a flop let's say it's something like this right so i mean first you can ask yourself kind of what do you think someone's going to do but now, out of position can bet some and they can check some and it gives them the option for multiple bet sizes. But you'll see down here where it says UTG or, you know, low jack uh, that they're checking 55 percent of the time. They're mostly only using that small bet size of one point eight two, which looks like it's third pot. Um, right. That's third pot. And then two seventy five is half pot and uh, four thirteen is probably uh, three quarters pot. So. If we if we look at that, it basically wants to choose that smallest bet size, but it wants to do a lot of checking. And now if you were actually trying to implement this, you would probably look at that 2% of 2.75. We can actually click on it over here, right? Um, just below this matrix of all the hands. Um, uh, there's so many things to look at. Like this shows the distribution of how you play the different elements of the distribution. Don't worry about that. But like you can click on the 2.75 and this shows all the hands that you want to bet for that sizing. Does that look like a strategy that a human is going to implement? I don't think so, right? So when we actually decide what to do, we could click on that and the 182 and be like, these are the hands we're going to bet and we're just going to use the sizing of 1.82. Now that's still a pretty complicated scenario, right? Where we're just looking at it, we're like, I guess we're going to mix. You know, what hands are we betting the most? Well, it looks like ace king we're betting a lot. Some of these gut shots like king queen and king jack, right? And, and queen jack as well. And then pocket tens, pocket eights. Those are sets. Ace eight, ace ten. So most of the strong value hands we're betting a lot, right? Pocket aces, we do a little bit more checking. Um, and over time, you get to recognize these things. Often top set checks a lot more than the lower sets. Why? Because... It's, it's harder to get value with top set because you're blocking all the top pair hands, right? It's hard for somebody else to have like ace queen here when you have two of the aces. Um, 
Similarly, hands like uh, pocket kings, queens, jacks, you know, nines, these hands check a lot. Like nines check a lot because they're just below the 10, right? Um, sevens check a lot. They're just below the eight. And then when you get down to the lower pocket pairs, you see weird stuff like the pocket threes actually do a lot of betting. And that's probably because it's going to be a more effective bluff in, in certain scenarios, right? Um, so when you look at this data, the idea isn't to like try and memorize it. It's to look at it and think, Okay, uh, this is the gist of theoretical play in this spot, right? And to just kind of soak it up and you can kind of approximate it, but you, you want to understand things like, okay, these pocket pairs are doing a lot of checking, right? And over time you look and you say, oh, these small pocket pairs end up being really good bluffs in a lot of spots. And um, we could go back to the full strategy and look at the checking, right? And if we, we get rid of everything else, we, we highlight just the checking, you can see yeah, there's a lot of these big pairs are checking, right? These smaller pocket pairs, like six, five just gives up. It just straight up gives up, right? A lot of these king high hands don't really want to bet that much. Um, the, the boxes, it looks like top to bottom is what percentage we had going to the flop, right? So we only had this height of king six suited because mostly we folded it in the low jack. We don't raise it that much. Whereas a hand like king queen suited, you can see it as the full vertical portion of the box and the horizontal portion is uh, the percentage of that portion that is being bet. And then you look at a hand like ace deuce and some of it was folded pre-flop and then some of it is checked and some of it is bet here. Uh, this is probably going too deep. You, you don't need to pay attention to all this. Um, but let's say, let's say there's a bet and then in position uh, has to respond, right? So out of position bet, in position folds all these hands in red. So you can look at it and be like, oh, I'm supposed to call some of these pocket pairs. Oh, that's tough. But then you can hover over them and you see on the lower right, okay, mostly it's, it's it like doesn't want to have a club because it wants to, yeah. So like you look at it and you're like, I don't know. Um, and you can kind of just approximate, right? You can be like, yeah, you can probably mostly fold those under pairs. That's probably okay, right? King nine suited, you could definitely fold that. But any board pair, you want to look at this and be like, okay, are there any 8x hands that are folding? No, right? There's no top pair that's folding, right? Unless there's red, we could basically just highlight red and be like, these are the only hands you're supposed to fold. Everything else you're supposed to continue, right? So continue means you can raise or you can call. And most of those hands are doing some mix, right? Some mix of calling and raising. The, the small aces are mostly just calling. Pocket queens are pure calling. Whereas a hand like... Um, Pocket eights, pocket tens, those are doing a lot of raising. In order to actually implement something like this perfectly, you're gonna have to use some kind of a randomizer or something like that, but you don't have to implement it perfectly. The idea is just to kind of understand the gist of what the solver's doing. And as we get to later streets, right, we can say, okay, there's a call. And then let's say the turn is another ace, right? And you you understand like, okay, what's happening now? And um, you know, I'm just going to be doing this every day in June for two hours, and I'm going to pick one spot and just dig into it. Not one spot in terms of one hand, but one situation like button uh, versus big blind or something like that, right? And just dig into it for two hours. And I mean, I can play around with these things for a long time. I'm not actually going to get up to all the features. This is kind of the gist of how it works. Yeah, I mean, it's so powerful. Like there's things here, it shows you, you know, how often do you have quads and how do you play those in general? How do you play your full houses in general? How do you play your trips, right? And th there's just, there's a lot of features and this is not really a deep dive into those features. This is just, here's, here's a little bit here's the gist of it here's basically what it does and if you have any questions ask them in the comments please like and subscribe it's super helpful for the channel yeah so i'm not going to explain every feature right i mean that would be that would literally take hours probably and at some point i i can make thorough guides for these um for everybody right but for the moment I just kind of wanted to give you a taste of kind of the idea of how it works so that uh, if you want to come hang out with me, 10 a.m. Pacific every day in June, uh, barring medical or family emergencies, um, I'm going to be sitting here for a couple hours studying one situation and each day will be a different situation. I will throw those up on YouTube, Zen Madman Poker on YouTube. Uh, you're watching this here. So yeah, hit like and subscribe. It's super helpful for the channel. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Peace.